here's a riddle for you. There's two filmmakers, right? Both of whom are revered and respected in motion picture history in their own ways. But one of them is known for taking artistic license with historical accuracy and watering down source material to fit a more audience-pleasing narrative. So when both of them are presented with a major historical event in the American Civil War, who do you suppose retold the story more respectfully to those who were involved in it? Ah, I bet you weren't expecting that, were you? The Great Locomotive Chase of 1862 was loosely adapted by Buster Keaton in 1926 to form his masterpiece, The General. Thirty years later, Walt Disney adapted one of the survivors' accounts of the story to make his adaptation, The Great Locomotive Chase. What's it all about? Well, I could do spoiler alert, but if you know about The Great Locomotive Chase itself, then it'll come as no surprise to you that the story is based around that well-known railway story of the day, Old Iron. Now, me personally, I had no idea this adaptation existed until the early 2000s, by which time I'd seen the general, became aware of the chase itself, and started reading a few reviews of an adaptation from the Disney company made in 1956. The reviews were not good. While a bit vague, people like Roger Ebert basically implied the general was the better film, especially as it was better received over time. But me being the curious rail fan who sought out anything where a steam train would appear, even if it was just a few seconds, I kept my eyes peeled and my mind open. So when the Disney version randomly aired on ITV one Sunday afternoon back in 2004, I watched it and it actually turned out to be a lot better than the critics said it was. While the story itself takes a bit of time to get going and ends on a bit of a downer, the rail fan and budding historian within me was taken by surprise at just how straight it was played out. Of course, it's not 100% accurate, as very few of even the best historical adaptations are, but it's better than that Ridley Scott Napoleon thing. If you'd like a full contemporary account of the events leading up to, on and after April the 12th, 1862, then I can recommend reading Stealing the General by Russell S. Bonds. But for what the film is, and what it could have been, it's actually really good, particularly in terms of production design. The locomotives and rolling stock seem very apt, right down to the evident lack of air brakes. You want one of these classic 440s to stop? Just chuck it in full reverse. Being filmed in Georgia, specifically on the Tallulah Falls Railroad, as opposed to Oregon, the Great Locomotive Chase already has the upper hand to the general, as it didn't need to dress things down quite so much. It's also just nice to see the engines that appear in the film. William Mason as the general, Inyo as the Texas, that Norris replica from the Baltimore and Ohio Museum even gets a cameo as Yonar. And for the most part, the sequence of events more or less matches contemporary findings. The spies board the train in Marietta, having spent the previous night in a railroad hotel, and steal the engine and three boxcars at Big Shanty, where the passengers and crew stop for breakfast. The conductor, William Fuller, played by Geoffrey Hunter, chases them on foot initially before nabbing a handcart, then Yonar, which in reality was another standard 440 instead of a Norris. The raiders talk their way past a very tense exchange involving two other trains coming in the opposite direction, one of which was fleeing from a Union victory in Huntsville, Alabama, closing in on Chattanooga. In total, the general managed to get past six other engines, including the Texas taking a southbound freight, which Fuller had to flag down in order to reverse up the line in pursuit. Telegraph operators were picked up and dropped off along the way while communication lines were severed. A major risk was taken with pursuing the chase through what is known as Tunnel Hill, where the raiders wanted to ambush the Texas while Fuller's party took the risk to just press on. And in the end, the general, being prevented from stopping for water and wood, runs dry while still in Confederate territory, leading the Andrews raiding party being captured and eight of them, including Andrews himself, being executed. From a storytelling perspective, this film is very anticlimactic. We see it from the point of view of the Union spies, specifically from the one who published the most accounts of the story, William Pittenger, played by John Upton. In the film, Pittenger is depicted as the first man to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor, though in reality he was the fifth to receive one, the first recipient being another member of the Andrews Raid, Private Jacob Parrott, who goes uncredited here. Being a civilian, James J. Andrews didn't receive a Medal of Honor, as is portrayed in the story, though his overall portrayal seems a little off, and I'm not just talking about the lack of facial hair. Fess Parker plays Andrews in this role, and apart from the change of clothes, it seems like he hasn't really left his Davy Crockett persona at the door. 
don't get me wrong, he puts in a respectable performance, and apart from the lack of facial hair, he does possess the physical qualities that Pittenger documented. But his performance seems a little too... stoic, too laid back, too casual, too... Fess Parker. Take this moment when the Raiders know they're beaten. Scatter and make for the woods, boys. Get home the best way you can. Does that strike you as someone who knows he's failed and has to run for his life? Oh, by the way, this scene where the cavalry showed up and chased them off didn't happen in reality either, so that's a Disney add-on. There's also this scene where the raiders tried to set fire to one of the covered bridges by parking a burning boxcar inside it, which, according to Bonds, didn't happen. But on the other hand, other inaccuracies pointed out by Bonds didn't even make it into the film. One myth surrounding the chase is that the Texas literally jumped over breaks in the track, which, while perhaps slightly plausible if this demonstration from World War II is anything to go by, would need a very specific amount of track taken out in order not to cause a major derailment at speed. The other myth is that the general was taken from Big Shanty in a hail of Confederate gunfire, which Bonds is also quick to dismiss in his book. But not only did Keaton not work this myth into his film, but Disney didn't work it in either. Jeffrey Hunter does a worthy job depicting William Fuller, though according to Bonds, while Fuller recognised Andrews as a regular passenger on the Western and Atlantic, he didn't know him by name, and they never talked just before the raid. So there's some swings and roundabouts with what was and wasn't portrayed here. Oddly enough, while pitching the idea of this film to Disney in 1952, Wilbur G. Kurtz, who worked as a technical advisor on Gone with the Wind, wrote in his letter, Never has a story been so badly mauled and twisted which, in some ways, was kind of true. Pittenger didn't play much of a role in the chase, yet his account needed several later corrections to downplay his importance in the raid and empathise with the South side of the story. Kurtz, who conducted numerous interviews with survivors from both sides, was the son-in-law of William Fuller and went on to work as technical advisor on Disney's film, so that would explain how he took an interest in the raid itself. But anyway, back to the story. Spoiler alert, the Union spies don't survive. Well, most of them don't. From a moviegoer's point of view, the protagonists don't get their happy ending in the same way that those in the general do. But on the other hand, that's probably the best way to represent the event. Considering Disney's creative license when it comes to adapting fairy tales with twisted underpinnings, seriously, if you know the original story of Sleeping Beauty, then you'll know what I'm talking about, it would have been easy to botch this film. They could have adapted the story so that the raiders are very nearly caught. There could have been a big chase with cavalry trying to stop the general, similar to how it played out in Northwest Frontier or Ticket to Tomahawk. And just when you think they're not going to make it, the raiders just make it into Union territory, maybe leaving the general wrecked on one of the bridges that gets destroyed in the process. Or there could be catchy song routines linking the scenes together similar to those in Davy Crockett. But as swashbuckling as the story is told, the truth still plays out as respectfully as it could be in any film adaptation, let alone a Disney one. The Union spies paid their price, and those that made it out, including Pittenger, either escaped or were traded with prisoners from the opposing side. Either way, there aren't any real winners or losers in this story. But perhaps while it doesn't necessarily give general audiences that happy ending, it does provide a necessary ending in the name of just making peace. Graham Clark of The Spinning Image talks of the ending offering unity in the eyes of civil war, saying that Disney were keen to emphasise that even in the midst of war, it was possible to set aside differences and come to a conclusion that there were good men involved in either side of the conflict. Therefore, the peace that two rivals make in the story after all the mayhem is over should be indicative of a nation that has been torn asunder but will unite again. And when you look at it like that, it sort of makes sense as to why the story is framed as it is. The Confederacy won the battle, but the Union won the war. And regardless of sides, war inevitably has decent human beings fighting against each other, even when they don't necessarily want to fight. Take, for instance, the scene where Pittenger and Andrews are discussing the Battle of Shiloh. Andrews says he believes in a federal union, wanting to unite both sides and allow each state to govern their own laws while answering to a national government. Meanwhile, Pittenger has a more personal reflection based on encountering a Confederate soldier earlier in the film. That soldier, he's supposed to be my enemy. I'm supposed to hate him the way Campbell does. I don't think I can. Later on, when the chase is lost and Andrews faces execution, 
He asks for Fuller's reconciliation, knowing that he won't be alive to see the end of the war. Someday the fighting will be over and both sides will have to shake hands. I won't be alive to see that day. Can we do it now? I'd be glad if you would, sir. In reality, Andrews and Fuller never reconciled. But perhaps scenes like these help to emphasise what both sides got in the end. The cruel twist of fate is that when Andrews was hung on the 7th of June in 1862, the tree he was hanging from proved to be too low, and the ground beneath him had to be dug out. So instead of a quick execution, Andrews was slowly suffocated to death. After a failed first attempt. What a pisser. When it's all said and done, from a storytelling perspective, I think Buster Keaton's The General is still the better film. It's more ambitious, more dramatic, has more memorable moments, and it rewards the audience for rooting for the characters whose story is seen from their point of view. But when it comes to a historic portrayal of one of the most daring and iconic acts of the American Civil War, Disney seems to have made the more tastefully accurate version. If you go into the great locomotive chase with an open mind and not expect everything to turn out all right in the end, as opposed to just dramatising the story, and if you keep in mind there's a few laid-back anachronistic overtones mixed in with the truth, you might be surprised by what you see from The House of Mouse. The film has enjoyed releases on VHS and later DVD, of which copies are still available, but given the recent trend to phase out physical media in line of declining DVD and Blu-ray sales, coupled with the fact this film isn't available on Disney+, Plus there may be a risk of this film being lost to obscurity. Okay, old man shouting at cloud moment incoming here. To anybody who tries to whack me saying, but bruh, DVDs are so out of date. Physical media can not only give films and TV shows a lifetime of relevance beyond their initial release date, but it provides easier income to objectively fine and serviceable projects that financially sank like a stone when they came out. Look at The Shawshank Redemption. Despite getting rave reviews from the likes of Siskel and Ebert, it bombed in the box office against the likes of Pulp Fiction and Forrest Gump. Yet a re-release on VHS later, and suddenly it's regarded as one of the best films of the 90s. The Great Locomotive Chase reportedly didn't do too well at the box office, but thanks to limited releases on home media, it's still being talked about and finding a new audience to this day. If a film like this came out today as a streaming exclusive and it didn't do very well, there's every chance that somebody like Paramount or Warner Brothers could just wipe it from existence in the name of tax breaking. I mean, 20 years ago, VHS was facing the same acts that DVD and Blu-ray are facing now, and with good reason. Technology's advance, immersion increases, streaming is easy going, yada yada yada. But suddenly, VHSs have become more collectible now more than ever due to the same pool of complications that streaming releases face whenever they get altered or disappear from existence. I could go on with examples, but I think the whole internet, Matt Damon and Christopher Nolan have already done it for me. So when it's all said and done, maybe it's worth, legitimately, getting a copy of this film now while you've still got the chance before it becomes ridiculously expensive in 10 years' time. Nobody would sell what people don't buy, after all. The Great Locomotive Chase may be one of the weaker and lesser satisfying films in Disney's catalogue, but as a visual interpretation of an American Civil War event centred around trains, it's surprising to see this wasn't completely butchered in the name of whimsical family entertainment. So, have you seen this film? Did you like it? Hate it? Found it to be historically accurate or triggering? Was there anything in particular about it that sticks in your mind? Or do you simply have time on your hands? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments below. Let's just hope it doesn't get a tasteless cash-grabbing remake in the future. With that being said, there is word that filmmaker John Patton Ford is writing a Netflix movie based around Bonds' book, so it'll be interesting to see how that turns out if it gets made. Or released. I'm Chris, and I'm here to gauge the issue.